Hey folks, welcome to the Dark Horse Podcast live stream number 180. No question of the primeness of that number. I'm Dr. Brett Weinstein. You are Dr. Heather Hying. I am. Um, do you know what today is? Yes. Damn. Uh, work with me. Do you know what today is? No. What's today? Today is day 13,279 no, of not. being a dude. Really? Yep. You did the math. I did do the math. Okay. I think I did it pretty carefully. Okay. But anyway, I think that's kind of a, a big accomplishment. Being a dude. Being a dude. Okay. Yeah. Well, congratulations, sir. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite something. You know, it's, uh, it's a rush. Yeah. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, consider switching to Rumble. That's where we are streaming as well, and that's where the chat is. Um, we are going to try to uh, not do so much at the top of the hour from, from now on and, and get into the heart of the... Part of the show, um, but I will say it is summer, which uh, is the is much more salient to me than how many days Brett has been a dude. And um, today we are going to be talking about. I mean, I'm very very pleased with your dudeness and all, and that well, you've never you. imagined that you could have changed it. But I'm um, you know I'm kind of gotten used to it. It doesn't no, change was... as rapidly as the seasons, you know. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, really not at all. Okay, so today we're going to talk a little bit about this conversation that you had, Brett, with uh, RFK Jr. back in November 2021, in which we released uh, in Dark Horse this week. We'll talk yep. a little bit about that. Uh, we're going to talk about adjuvants and allergies, and we're going to talk about affirmative action and any other words beginning in A that we might come up with. But those that's the plan for today. So we've alabaster. got a lot. Uh, we're not talking about alabaster, I despite what... what oh, my God. <laughs> it's going to be like that. Um, okay, so we're going to return after today's episode with a Rumble experience exclusive Q&A, as we are going to be doing uh, whenever we do Q&As. It's going to be on Rumble only, so please consider going to Rumble now if you're on YouTube, joining there. And of course, if you're just listening, continue just listening. Uh, we've got new merch. Uh, Zach is going to show it. It is. Uh, it was prompted by uh, something that you said a couple of live streams ago, and uh, it is at darkhorsestore.org. PSYOP until proven otherwise. Yes, and There's the artwork, it. and it's on shirts. It's on a backpack, I think. It's on stickers. And it's on this handsome gentleman on the shirt. So that's a little bit meta. Yes, I believe I was... Uh, I was. This artwork is on all of the things. True. <laughs> all right. Um, wow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recenter myself. Are you? <laughs> I am. And uh, How many days have you been a dude? 13,200... Mm. 79 if my calculations are correct and is that inclusive or exclusive wow <laughs> sorry it has a margin of error okay. of five days oh okay. i attempted to mm. get the leap years correctly calculated but i did not do a careful job so uh, yeah. it's possible that i'm off by a couple days here or there and as you point out we don't know whether we're counting today um Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, I think in some sense we shouldn't count today because we don't know that I'm going to be a dude for the full day until it's over. Yes, we do. Well, actually not. I was thinking of, um, you know, death, which can come at any time for you. I'm not expecting it, but if it did, that would mean... I hope it is many, many decades in the future, but at that point you will be a dead dude. Interesting point. This mm -hmm. brings up my, my point about uh, the mind brain distinction which we will save for another day i mean maybe like this is nothing that we're going to be talking about today we won't go on sex and gender at all but uh dude yes is a description of sex not just that at least the way i've calculated it um dude is a description of sex thus having nothing to do with mind it's it's well no no um so the way i calculated it Dude is something that happens on your 18th birthday. Wait, what? The definition of dude, which so I, I didn't, I didn't think about the number you produced at all. That was I starting was at 18. Sort of expecting you to calculate. Yeah, of course. Um, and a what was dude, your number? Thirteen thousand two hundred seventy-nine. Um, but dude, for the purposes of my calculation, was defined as adult human male, be or otherwise. Wait, what? Adult human male, be or otherwise. What does that mean? Male or female, either one. Because mm -hmm. that's how we use it in our house, because we grew up in California and we know how to properly use this term. How many days do you think you've been a dude? <laughs> 13,279. I'm going to be embarrassed if I'm way off, but 
Um, yeah, I mean, not all of them were good. Most of them were, but you know, it, it varies. That's the thing about life as a dude. Yeah. And, um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's about right. Yeah. The yeah. Rep, you're in the neighborhood at least. I'm, I'm in the neighborhood. Thank goodness. So dude is man, which is again, uh, reflective of, you know, adult human male. Male is about your sex, not your gender. Yeah, but the, we use the term interchangeably in our household. It's not, it's not a sex based term. But then you can't, you're not, haven't been a dude since you were 18 then. You were a dude before that. <laughs> I don't think so. I think it's kind of like you would refer to a child as sir, but you don't really mean it. We've got a 17-year-old son. Yes. You, you, you've called him dude a oh, lot. Oh, totally. But it's, it's a, you know, I, first of all, I know he's headed this direction. And second of all, it's sort of a, it's an honorific. Here I was trying it's to clear the decks, get rid of all <laughs> of the other stuff at the top of the hour, but no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm here we are. Testing the audience here to see if they can handle well, the truth. consider That's, them tested. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. Uh, so we have sponsors uh, for whom we are, for whom, for which, for that, we are very grateful. Uh, all of whom have products or services that we actually and truly vouch for. We always start these live streams with three right at the top of the hour. Here we go. And they are Biome, American Hartford Gold, and Seed. Our first sponsor this week is Bio, maker of Nobs, N-O-B-S. Nobs is a new kind of dentifrice. Dentifrice is a word that I learned um, upon looking into Nobs. Actually, I learned it from you. You learned it from me, didn't I, you? I mean, I'd heard it before, but I figured it was just a fancy word for toothpaste. But no, dentifrice is anything you use to clean your teeth. It could be toothpaste, but also powders or, in fact, Nobs. Nobs are fantastic. We started using this product several months ago and approached them a bit being a sponsor rather than the other way around. Biome, that's B-I-O-M, Biome without an E on the end, makes a fantastic product that all four of us, Brett and me and Zach, our producer, and Toby, aforementioned 17-year-old, now use it daily. And we can attest that uh, there's a word missing here, and I wrote this. Um, we can attest that they are telling the truth when they say that they are a brand focused on transparency, safety, and efficacy. I think I was just like getting rid of pronouns. and I, Yeah, I, you yeah, went a bit too far. It's way too far. Yeah. Um, Seriously, Biome says they're brand focused on transparency, safety, and efficacy, and we're convinced. Let's talk fluoride for a moment. Fluoride is the anti-cavity ingredient in most toothpastes that you already know about. But as we discuss in our book, Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, the fluoride in drinking water and toothpaste is not in a molecular form that is found in nature or that has ever been part of our diet. And ever more research is pointing to neurotoxicity from fluoride exposure, especially in children. Knobs from Biome doesn't contain fluoride, but that in and of itself doesn't make it unique. Many oral care products are now abandoning fluoride as the research continues to emerge about its toxicity. But unlike comparative products, Knobs includes a different and far better remineralizing agent, and that is hydroxyapatite. Hydroxyapatite is the main component of the enamel in your teeth and is in your bones as well. It has been extensively studied in medicine and dentistry and is as effective as fluoride in remineralizing to tooth or teeth without the toxicity of fluoride. Hydroxyapatite doesn't merely stop cavities from forming, it can even arrest tooth decay once it's underway. Uh, and I have, a, I have a reference on that if you're interested. Excellent. I love ads with references. <laughs> I like I like putting primary ref, primary scientific literature into our ads. It makes me I once happy. wrote a poem with a reference, but that's a story for a different day. Yeah. 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 And I remember this. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So hydroxyapatite can actually arrest tooth decay once it's underway. Uh, it is a great remineralizing remineralizing agent with no known toxicity, unlike fluoride, and that is what is in knobs. Furthermore, even most natural toothpastes that are free of fluoride still have lots of abrasive ingredients like charcoal, baking soda, and eggshells. Knobs has none of these things. Knobs also has no sulfates, no parabens, no phthalates, or microplastics, no BS. N-O-B-S. It's right there in the name. Furthermore, Knobs comes in the form of dehydrated tablets, which allows them to be shelf-stable without any preservatives. Take a tablet, chew it a few times, and brush as normal. Your teeth are going to feel fantastically clean because they are. Also, unlike with toothpaste, TSA has no interest in Knobs because they're tablets, so if you're flying with Knobs, you don't risk losing your dentifrice in security. So check out Knobs at www.betterbiome.com slash darkhorse. That's again, biome without the E. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-B-I-O-M. I'm going to say that again, B-E-T-T-E-R-B-I-O-M dot com slash dark horse. Listeners can enjoy 15% off their first one month supply of knobs from now until July 17th, 2023. All right. Our second sponsor this week is American Heart for Gold. 
If you listen to Dark Horse regularly, you already know just how incompetent and unstable many of our institutions are becoming. Inflation, probably even if you don't listen to Dark Horse regularly, you know that because how could you not? Inflation is at its highest level in 40 years. Interest rates are sky high. We are caught between runaway inflation and a recession, and our leaders are increasingly nonsensical. All of this threatens businesses, jobs, and retirement funds. Finding ways to secure your nest egg and insulate your wealth is more important than ever, and adding precious metals to your assets is a great way to stabilize your investments and protect yourself financially. American Hartford Gold is a precious metals dealer that can help you do just that. American Hartford Gold helps individuals and families protect their wealth by diversifying with precious metals. They make it simple and easy to protect your savings and retirement accounts with physical gold and silver. With one short phone call, they can have physical gold and silver delivered right to your door or inside your IRA or 401k. They are the highest rated firm in the country with an a rating from the Better Business Bureau and thousands of satisfied clients. If you call them right now, they will give you up to $5,000 of free silver on your first qualifying order. Contact them today by visiting the link in the episode description or call 866-828-1117. That's 866-828-1117 or text Dark Horse to 998899. Once more, that's 866-828-1117 or text Dark Horse to 998899. All right. Our final sponsor this week is Seed, a probiotic that really works. Your gut and your immune system work together, coordinating your body's response to the world both around and within you. Seed helps improve the health of your gut microbiome, which means that it supports you becoming healthier overall. Our resident gut gut microbiome directly impacts the development and function of the immune system. Even before we're born, microbes inform your immune system, teaching our body how to distinguish benign substances and pathogenic antigens, that is, substances that our body doesn't recognize as its own. You can support your gut immune axis, the axis of awesome, in a variety of ways, including by prioritizing sleep. Your body operates on a 24-hour cycle, your circadian rhythm. New research suggests that the gut microbiome has its own circadian clock, and that changes Uh, to your normal rhythms, and that changes to your normal rhythms can disrupt your microbes and important functions that they perform. Prioritizing regular and sufficient sleep can help us keep our gut uh, immune axis healthy. You can also support your gut immune axis by taking Seed's DS01 Daily Symbiotic. Seed is a plant-based prebiotic and probiotic with 24 strains that have been clinically or scientifically studied for their benefits. 16 of those 24 strains are specifically geared towards digestive health, as you would expect from a probiotic, and four of the 24 probiotic strains are known to promote healthy skin. Your skin, like your gut, has its own microbiome. Seed supports, supports both gut and skin health. Seed is free from 14 major classes of antigens, including but not limited to sugar, animal products, soy, gluten, peanut, glyphosate, dairy, shellfish, and corn. And Seed is basically double-hulled with its capsule-in-capsule design. It is engineered to maintain viability through your digestive tract until it reaches your colon where you want it. And the same design makes it resistant to oxygen, moisture, heat, and heat, meaning that no refrigeration is necessary. Seed's daily symbiotic support Reading is not going so well for me today, but I'm I'm getting there. You're doing great, man. Thank you. Welcome. Um, seeds. Axis of awesome. The axis of awesome. Okay. Yes. Uh, seeds daily symbiotic supports guts and skin and heart health uh, and micronutrient synthesis. We have heard from several people who have used seed and report improvements to their digestive function in 24 to 48 hours. So start a new healthy habit today. Visit seed.com/darkhorse. And use the code Dark Horse to receive to redeem twenty five percent off your first month of Seed's DS01 Daily Symbiotic. That's seed.com slash Dark Horse and use the code Dark Horse at checkout. Awesome. All right. Axis of awesome. Axis of awesome. Again, that's Biome, American Hartford Gold, and Seed. For whom we are grateful, all of them. And also grateful. To Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Absolutely. For the conversation uh, that you had with him back in November 2021 and for many other things besides. Indeed. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the conversation that I had with Bobby Kennedy Jr. in November and in particular why it was that we didn't release it until now. 
Now, I will say, I was never planning to keep this secret. In fact, I made a little video uh, that explained some of my reasoning that I placed on my Twitter subscriber feed so subscribers mm. could see it. And Twitter behaved very oddly with respect to this post. Is it not? Subscribers it saw it, but it was invisible to people mm. who did not subscribe, which is not the way Twitter is supposed to function. I have no idea what that was about. But it's still up. It's still up. Mm. People, if you want to subscribe, you can see it. Um, I may at some point show it to the public just so you can see I wasn't pretending or anything like that. But yeah. what interested me was that there was a lot of discussion about nefarious motives that would have caused us to release this now. Why now? Why not in November 2021? And uh, Nefarious? Okay. Well, I don't know. People okay. alleged that we had been paid by somebody, oh. that we had coordinated with the Kennedy campaign. None of this is true. Um, so anyway, I thought I would just clear up the mystery. So, right, not true, but also if, if we had, which we didn't, coordinate with the Kennedy campaign, how would that be nefarious? Well, you can imagine... One can apparently imagine well, I mean, that there the people, would be... People can hurl crap at you all you want. They can, I'm, and I mean, look, I think this is a useful lesson because yeah. in this particular case... You, the audience, can't really know any more than you can know anywhere else. But you and I are in a perfect position to know for certain exactly why we did what we did mm -hmm. and that none of the things that are being hypothesized are true. Um, but the idea that people are so primed to see nefarious motives that anything that is in any way out of the ordinary or seems to help somebody that they don't like is instantly triggering of uh, hypotheses. So first of all, let's clear up what happened. Uh, Bobby Kennedy came to our house. You can see in this uh, podcast, it is our old studio uh, in the, uh, the sauna we, <laughs> that we used to have in Portland. Yeah. Um, and we had what I thought was a fantastic conversation. The problem is, if I can just recap the history here for people who maybe haven't followed us for very long, you and I, once upon a time, were professors of biology. Mm. And our careers as professors at a state school, which you would think is a very safe career, came to a spectacular end when the college went into full meltdown, uh, at least in part, surrounding our opposition to um, policy proposals that were being advanced at the college that it was our obligation to object to because they weren't good policy proposals. So that was the first time our income evaporated. Yep. The second time that happened when after COVID began and you and I started unpacking the biological details of COVID, we inevitably ran up against the preposterous features of the narrative that we were all being given about um, repurposed drugs, about uh, the origin of the virus, about vaccine safety and effectiveness. And um, as that was well more than a, a year after COVID began, well more than a year after we'd, be do we'd been doing these live streams, um, that, you know, our income was once again, evaporated, evaporated by YouTube demonetizing us. Yeah. Uh, and I've uh, forgotten exactly where it happened, but either after the Corey podcast or the Malone Kirsch podcast, um, YouTube know. demonetized our channel and it has never been remonetized. So the bulk of our income came through YouTube and YouTube killed it within an hour. They, they demonetized both of our channels and they never, uh, they never fixed that, even though they were obviously wrong about these issues. Okay, so having had Bobby Kennedy Jr. to our house and had a very good discussion in the heat of the pandemic at the point when uh, a tremendous amount of firepower was directed at us over our uh, dissident stance on various issues of COVID, uh, I and we thought it was too risky to release that podcast, and so we didn't. Now, it wasn't strictly about YouTube. There was lots of stuff pointed at us across many domains. We don't know the nature of it. All we can tell is that a huge amount of money was spent to slander and uh, to slander us and others and to uh, prevent audience from ever finding us. Um, so in the midst of that environment, we made a decision that it just wasn't safe to release this podcast. So I, the we is you and Bobby? Is that is that the we you're talking about? Collectively, we 
uh, in it was not Bobby. Bobby would have been okay with releasing okay. it because mm -hmm. he had, in large measure, already paid the price of his stances in public. So sure. yep. um, he was ready to go. But we, those of us uh, involved in Dark Horse, which is a tiny number, just decided not to release it. The um, other question is why now, right? And the answer to why now is, to be honest, I had forgotten. It wasn't that I didn't know that we had recorded the podcast, but as I was watching other discussions with Bobby Kennedy, it occurred to me, hey, actually, we have a discussion with Bobby Kennedy, and it covered lots of stuff in a way that I thought was, frankly, not done elsewhere. And so it just mm -hmm. seemed like time to release it. Was it safe? I don't know. But uh, it seemed like a different environment than it, than it was in November of 2021. So... Anyway, that's why. Nobody paid us. No nefarious motives. Yes, it was somebody accused us or demanded that we prove that it had actually been recorded in November 2021. You can obviously tell that. Changes in facial hair, different studio. We don't own that building anymore. Um, all of those things. So that's the long and short of it. Um, I did want to continue, though, and talk a little bit about at least one of the things in this podcast, which I strongly advise people to take a look at. It's really good. And it also provides some interesting insight into where our mindset and Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s mindset was in November 2021. Um, it's also before his uh, corrective surgery for the wobble in his voice, which has changed his voice. So anyway, this is a, it's an interesting look into a moment in the past, not so long ago when things were, uh, were, were different. Um, in the podcast, actually pretty early in the podcast, we discuss an issue that you and I have discussed on this podcast many times since. We may have discussed it before then, too. I don't remember. But the issue is one of the particular technologies involved in the construction of modern vaccines. Um, and the, the one that Bobby lays out a very good description of why the vaccine landscape looks the way it does at a technological level. And what he says is that traditional vaccines involve attenuated versions of a live virus. That that has a positive side. The positive side is it produces a very robust immune response. The negative side is because you are using a live version of a pathogen, even though it's been attenuated, you can't control how it evolves once you have injected it. And in fact, there is substantial evidence that a large fraction of the cases, for example, of polio in the world today are actually downstream or of vaccine induced or vaccine induced polio. Mm -hmm. So that's a terrible story, right? You don't want to inject something that gets away from you by evolutionary uh, selection. The alternative has been to use inert either dead viruses or pieces of dead viruses. And the problem with that, it solves the evolutionary problem, but uh, it creates it, a different... It, it, sol it solves that particular evolutionary problem. Yes, it solves the problem of the pathogen getting away from you because you're not injecting a pathogen. You're injecting something that can't evolve because it doesn't reproduce. The problem with the fragments or dead viruses is that because you are not actually sick with anything, the immune system does not react uh in a significant way. It treats it as a mundane garbage collection problem rather than an infectious agent. And so it does not develop a robust immunity. It creates a very weak vaccine. And so what was discovered was that irritating the immune system with an adjuvant uh, causes the immune system to wake up and react. And so you can get a robust immune response to the antigens in the vaccine without running the risk of uh, selection taking your pathogen and making it increased safety in the domain of uh, reduced pathogenicity of the um, antigen that is being injected. Right. Now, I must say, I did not have a deep relationship with the idea of adjuvants prior to COVID and all of the investigation uh, surrounding vaccines all, that resulted. Yep. Um, in the aftermath of that, I feel that the story of vaccines as we find them today in the market 
is a very revealing story. It is a story that uh, illuminates many of the problems that we have in academic science. It illuminates the problems that we have in governmental policy. And let's just put it this way. In the podcast, I actually say that I love vaccines and that my skepticism of the COVID vaccines has me alarmed because this is a technology that I have actually lectured on um, as a, a huge benefit to society. And Not the COVID vaccines, not correct. mRNA vaccines, but traditional vaccines. Traditional vaccines. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say that today. I would say it very differently, as I, I'm sure you would. I would say the underlying fundamental technology at the heart of a vaccine, alerting the immune system to a pathogen that it has yet to encounter so that it is well prepared when it does encounter it, that is a beautiful, elegant mechanism. Priming the immune system. Priming the immune system with information could hardly be more elegant. Mm -hmm. However, the hazards involved in either creating a pathogen that can evolve or needing to use adjuvants to trigger a robust response, or in the case of COVID, some uh, third technology where we hijack your cells and turn them into vaccine factories. None of these things... Partial vaccine factories. Yeah. yeah. None of these things are... Or no, not vaccine factories, partial virus factories. Yeah. We basically use a pseudovirus to yeah. hijack cells, which yeah. then results in those cells being targeted. None of these things are, sense, are safe in principle, mm -hmm. right? They all carry significant dangers. Um, and in fact, I learned from a more recent discussion... Uh, by uh, RFK Jr. that the origin of pharmaceutical legal immunity surrounding vaccines was based on the argument that the production of vaccines, that vaccines were inherently unsafe. And therefore, if the government wanted uh, pharmaceutical companies to produce them, that it needed to immunize them from legal liability, right? And uh, much architecture is downstream of that. But nonetheless, these Some are... The most some of the most robust immunity we have. <laughs> it is, yeah. No breakthroughs. But, no breakthroughs uh, um, No breakthrough cases. Oh, it's almost too good. It is. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so anyway, it, what I wanted to say is I, I think many of us are now rethinking what we understood about vaccines. You and I wrote into our book that these were one of the three great medical triumphs of human history. And, I, and let me just say, um, you know, we I, I talked a bit about uh, last week on Dark Horse about the failure of any of the vaccines in the current uh, childhood vaccination schedule as recommend as produced and uh, enforced. I don't know about enforced as produced and recommended by the CDC. Um, none of them have been tested against placebo. And I ran through a couple of examples. And then I, I wrote about that some more also in my sub stack this week. That's um you know, specifically the issue. And, and in that I walk through some of, some of, you know, my personal history and the, it's also yours with regard to our approach to vaccines, like how, you know, how enthusiastic we have been and, and precisely as you just said, how, how enthusiastic I remain and I hear you remain about uh, the, the core, the core idea, the, the central idea and you know, while recognizing that inherently either, you know, put aside the mRNA, the, the, the new third version for the moment, um, but either of these, um, you know, the traditional, uh, the uh, attenuated, yeah, attenuated um, vaccines have the risk of, um, you know, the, the virus or other pathogen evolving in you into, you know, and, and, and making you sick with the disease itself, uh, or the, the dead or partial virus or other pathogen requiring adjuvants in order to trigger your immune system enough. Uh, you know, th there are risks in both cases. Neither, neither of them are inherently safe. Um, but I continue to believe that at least in that first category, that original category of vaccine, that there are vaccines that have done far more good than harm. Um, I guess, you know, one doesn't know how to engage in the proper level of skepticism when you discover that you've been hoodwinked. Over um, and over, over and over, and over again. again. Yes. So what I would say is, here's what isn't safe and effective for-profit pharma being in charge of the production of these things and then the testing of them. That's okay? right. That's clearly not safe. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's lethal. 
as for whether or not vaccines can be uh, can have a risk reward ratio that makes them favorable, I still believe that they can. But what I am certain of is that we need to set a high bar for the establishment that a vaccine is worth the risks that come with it, right? We need a robust academy that can test that question, and we need uh, uh, governmental regulators that um, prevent the release of, you know, a vaccine that seems to have a marginal benefit isn't worth it because the risks that come along with it that may uh, be hard to detect are, aren't worth it. So mm -hmm. I would like to see this technology leveraged well for humanity on the basis of net benefit that is well established in careful tests that are not corrupted. Yes. All of that said, the reinvestigation of vaccines, how they are produced, and my own history with them has me in the following predicament. I, a professor who have literally lectured on this technology and told my students how marvelous it is, believe that I was in some sense misled in a way that I often talk about with respect to other topics, right? Where you come to believe the diagram in the textbook, mm -hmm. right? The yeah. diagram in the textbook that describes how vaccines are produced and work yeah. does not talk about adjuvants typically, right? It yeah. talks about the underlying technology, yeah. which is elegant. If you had told me that there were ingredients in the vaccines whose purpose was to to uh, annoy the immune system, to, to agitate it, I would have said, well, how much downside is there to doing that, right? Now, in the podcast that we just released, the November 2021 podcast from The Vault, uh, Bobby Kennedy reveals that he, his sp uh, spasmodic dystonia, the... the uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think it's dystonia. Okay. Um, the wobble in his voice, he did not know, he had no reason to think that it was the result of uh, a vaccine injury until, as a lawyer who was working on the question, he ended up reading, I think, the insert of a flu vaccine, which specifically named the condition he had as a known side effect. Mm -hmm. So that was very late. It did, this did not trigger his interest in it, but nonetheless, he came to think that quite possibly he was suffering from a vaccine injury himself. Now, I also wonder if several pathologies that I have might be the result of this, mm. in particular uh, allergies, which have um, had a pretty significant impact on my life. Mm. Uh, the three <coughs> that are most important are Long-time listeners will know I have a severe wheat allergy triggered by even the tiniest contact with wheat, a little wheat in a soy sauce that somebody includes and doesn't think about wheat because it says on the bottle it's made of soy. That's enough to trigger me, right? Why do I have a wheat allergy? My ancestors have been eating wheat for thousands of years. Um, I also have a pretty debilitating allergy to grass pollen on days when the grass is flowering uh, I, you know, I just become a drippy mess. Become so sad. Yeah, not not obvious why. <laughs> Sorry, that would be <laughs> just like tears flow. Like it, it looks yeah. like sadness. It's but you're, not. Yeah. It's not good. Yeah. But and then there is the fact, and which I've talked about years ago on the podcast, that I have an allergy to marijuana. Mm. Right. It's an allergy that, until my current thinking on vaccines, I credited to uh, overuse of marijuana. But. I now wonder if what's going on in all of these cases is that you are injected with a vaccine that is based on antigens rather than uh, living pathogens. It comes with an adjuvant. That adjuvant wakes up your immune system and it starts reacting to molecules that it finds present in your system, whether that's things that are leaking out of your gut and are exposed to your immune system in the case of wheat, mm. whether it's pollen that has entered your lungs because you're breathing it in. If you happen to have gotten vaccinated during grass flowering season. Right. Or if, you know, you are using marijuana and you're smoking it. So just to put a little interesting color on this, here, here's the thing about my marijuana allergy. And A, my marijuana allergy in the end, I hesitate to say this because I can't believe that it would actually be in that positive. I don't think it 
is net positive, but it certainly did make it easy to quit. Um, so, yeah. you know, here's the question. If, um, if I smoke pot, I react, I get a ton of mucus, uh, in my lungs. If I eat, I'm, I'm too old to have done edibles, I guess, or I quit before edibles were a thing, but pot brownies were a thing. Mm -hmm. If I eat a pot brownie, my lungs fill with mucus, which is interesting immunologically, right? What it means is that the locus of my allergy is in my lungs. And even if the antigen comes in from the backside through the blood supply, uh, it still triggers that mucosal yep. uh, immunity in my lungs. So the question is, did I get a shot, probably a flu shot, in college mm -hmm. and or, or one of these uh one of these shots you need to travel to travel that's also possible yellow I fever suppose. or rabies or something or yeah, yeah I'd, I'd have to go back and look the most likely is flu shot because i got a lot of them um which i now worry it was not such a good idea they're not very effective shots and the idea of revaccinating uh in the same antigenic neighborhood again and again is uh suspect to me now but yeah, I'm not sure that they were um, so so common then. What? Flu shots. I got them. In the early 90s? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, in any case, the, the, over, the, the overarching point here is we have an epidemic of allergies, right? Now, I've heard some rather compelling explanations. We talk about, you know, the hygiene hypothesis. We talk about um, the absence of uh, parasitic worms that we have, the IgE mm -hmm. system, that's yep. the Ig immunoglobulin uh, uh, E is particularly associated with allergies, that that system is not busy because we don't have worms and it can be caused to react to things that uh, are not actually pathogens. But the question is, given the number of allergies, is one of the important factors the environmental context following an injection with an adjuvanted vaccine? Is that why I have an allergy to wheat? Is that why I have an allergy to grass? Is that why I have an allergy to marijuana? And, oh, go ahead. No, I mean, the, the, the prediction, of course, is uh, that uh, you would not see an uptick in allergies following uh, vaccination with live, attenu live attenuated vaccines. Um, if, if they also do not have adjuvants and why would they need them? Yep. Right. Uh, so that vaccines without adjuvants, uh, are at least far, far less likely, um, to produce other kinds of, of immune responses developing. Although, you know, it's, it's possible there would be some because you are triggering the immune system to respond to some degree, but the adjuvants um, produce a sort of a generalized, like, oh my God, what's going on <laughs> response in, in the immune system that uh, the prediction is uh, will then have broader, more far-reaching effects with regard specifically to things like allergies, asthma, potentially other health effects as well. Absolutely. So um, that raises a question about how we ought to be testing these things and against what. In mm -hmm. other words, you know, the net effect is really what we care about, right? You do care about yeah. your immunity to the pathogens in question, but the question is how much cost are you willing to pay for that immunity, for a one-year immunity to uh, a flu that you will get, it will suck, and you will get better, right? Would you pay with a lifetime of allergies, of seasonal allergies? You know, could you reduce the effect of the seasonal allergies um, by immunizing at a moment that was low allergen? Could you, you know, have an air filter that filtered a large fraction of the air that you breathed in the two weeks following a vaccination? There are lots of things that we could potentially do. Well, but also um, dietary concerns, right? Mm -hmm. So to, to your point about um, is it possible that your gluten allergy and that many other people's rise in dietary allergies is related to an effectively inflamed immune system following vaccination, uh, that doesn't inherently mean that those vaccines with their adjuvants are something that should never be given to anyone again. That's a separate question. Um, but at the very least, uh, it is quite possible that a much reduced diet 
in the wake of, and I don't know if that means two a days, two weeks, diet. a hypoallergenic diet uh, in the you know two days, two weeks, I don't know what the right time span would be, following vaccination um, might then mean that you would develop fewer uh, food allergies down the road once, because the, once you started, res once you resumed eating your normal diet after your immune system had calmed the fuck down, yeah. right? Yeah. Um I would also, you know, again, there are many things. Is there a protocol like you're describing that would be helpful? There's also the question of what is the threshold of benefit with respect to the pathogen in question that needs to be reached to deal with an amorphous concern about various environmental sensitivities that you might develop. But I would point out, yes. those are not just quality of life concerns, which are not minor, right? Obviously, the pathology that I suffered before discovering that I had a wheat allergy and the pathology that I still, still suffer when I uh, end up eating wheat without knowing that it's there, right? That is a sig significant uh, degradation in quality of life. Absolutely. Um, but the uh, this is also a question of life and death, right? Lots of people, we know people who have died from asthma, mm -hmm. right? Which is an allergic response in most people. So, you know, we're talking about serious degradation in quality of life and the loss of many lives to an undescribed pathology that may well be, and I would point out, once you know that the technology involved in vaccines involves uh, inflaming the immune system to get a more robust response, it is an absolutely obvious hypothesis that some fraction of the overactivity of the immune system is the result of that very same technology. Absolutely. And this is a this is a different point, but related and critical, which is that uh, much as when adults decide to travel someplace where, for instance, yellow fever is endemic and either have a choice to make uh, or the choice is actually you can't go there if you don't get this vaccine. It is a different kind of choice to make. Uh, they, we, end up carefully assessing all the parts, which is um, how bad is the disease? What are my chances of exposure to it? What are the chances of if I'm exposed, I will get it? If I am exposed and I get it, what are the chances? You know, is there treatment available? Will I have access to the treatment? If I, you know, what's what's the CFR? Like what, you know, what are what are how bad is the disease and what are my chances of getting a bad case of it? We do that as adults when we make decisions about, for instance, uh, the vaccinations that we get when we travel, uh, especially to tropical regions, as you and I have spent a lot of our time, especially in our 20s, doing. But as I was talking about last week, the proliferation of vaccines in the childhood vaccination schedule from um, a handful uh, when we were children getting vaccinated to an incredible number now uh, has never, so far as I remember from when our own children were young, nor have I ever you know, heard in mainstream circles, been accompanied by a discussion of, oh, okay, the CDC is recommending a new vaccine for disease X. Let us tell you about disease X. Let us tell you how it manifests, how common it is, whether or not there's treatment aside from the vaccine, uh, you know, whether or not your child is actually at risk of being exposed to it. And all of those are actually highly relevant to a question of whether or not this is the right thing to do for the health of a person with regard, you know, it's not just this disease is something that we have a vaccine for, therefore you get it. If you live in Los Angeles and you are never leaving Los Angeles, no one is suggesting to you that you get a yellow fever vaccine. Yep. No one. Okay. If you live, if you are born, uh, if, if you live in Los Angeles, no one is, and you are 30, no one is suggesting to you that you go get a new uh, polio vaccine or smallpox vaccine, right? We, we understand this, and yet we are, <clears throat> we are, we are labeled, we are vilified, we are, you know, we are labeled as anti-vaxxers, we are vilified for saying it's not sufficient that you, the company with the financial interest in making sure that as many people as possible take this thing, assure me that your product is good against a disease that I don't know anything about. Now, 
maybe it's your responsibility to educate me and then I'm going to go try to find a, diff- a second opinion as to what that disease is and what my actual risk factors are. Um, but I'd also like to know why we aren't simultaneously focused as much or more on treatment for the very, very rare things. You know, we hear a lot about, you know, prevention is better than, than treatment. And in the abstract, I think that's true. But if we're talking about, especially if we're talking about children at, at, at very low risk from things that don't actually circulate in children, okay, what if, what if somehow your child um, did come down with hepatitis B? What is there to be done about it? Like, how did, how did that child come down with hepatitis B in the first place? But like, what, what would the treatment be? And might, for those conditions that a child is very, very unlikely to get exposed to, uh, wouldn't treatment, wouldn't knowing that there is treatment out there be at least an approach that we could talk about as an alternative to, uh, to the rapid proliferation of non-placebo tested vaccines on the childhood vaccination schedule. The problem, what you have said is perfectly reasonable. It's effectively unassailable because all you're asking for is the obvious evidence that the thing is worthwhile in the context of the thing to which it's targeted, right? Right. The problem here, uh, I'm increasingly aware, is that for some reason, without any discussion that I am aware of, Mm -hmm. vaccines have become sacred yep right these are things about and and you know who did and, this and all you have to do to make it into a vaccine apparently is to say that's a vaccine that's a vaccine it is blessed yes. as a vaccine abracadabra you're a vaccine and Ab- that's what happened with covid that and that is what happened with the mrna shots which mm-hmm. are not vaccines right right was that they were blessed as vaccines and having been blessed it was impossible to raise the obvious questions, which is what got you and me in so much trouble, Mm -hmm. right? What you and I, I I will remind people of the history. What we said when these things were announced, at the point that we still thought these might be very useful, they might be the way that we actually uh, got back to normal life after COVID, right? We figured we would we would delay as long as we, we would felt delay we could, because that was we reasonable. We would them. delay yep. in the same way that we delayed our children's vaccinations when they were kids. Vaccinations we knew they would get, but we mm-hmm. delayed them so that their development would be as complete as possible at the point that they got them. But what you and I said that ran us afoul of the power structure that put us in the jeopardy that caused us not to release the RFK podcast back in November of 2021. What we said was these vaccines may very well be effective, but when they tell us that they are safe, they cannot possibly know that, right? Now, that is the mildest criticism you could possibly level, right? We didn't say that they were harmful. We said they don't know that they're safe because they haven't been around long enough for them to know long-term what happens if you take one, and that means they are unsafe, right? It doesn't mean they're harmful, but it means in the same way that driving drunk may do no harm, but it isn't safe. These vaccines are not safe. And the point is, for that minimal, obvious, nearly tautological criticism, (laughs) you and I were cast out as heretics, right? right? So here's my point. We have discovered that there is something sacred inside of our medical establishment, our scientific establishment. Right. Not even it's 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 culture wide. Well, that's true. But the point is, it is emanating from the high church of science and the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Right. And the point is, we know who the bad people are. They are the ones who will criticize our sacred thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, how did that happen? Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. The benefit of the doubt is that public health erected for itself a right to lie. And the reason that a direct a right to lie, if we give it the benefit of the doubt, is that in order to avoid a collective action problem where people get the benefit of other people's being vaccinated without taking their tiny share of the risk, that we needed to tell them things were safe that were not perfectly safe, right? right. Now, that was A, bullshit, and B, a violation of Nuremberg in and of itself. Yes. Right? Public health is not allowed to lie to us about... Um, treatments that we are taking because we have a right to informed consent that as you and i pointed out several weeks ago uh was sufficient that 
implied right to informed consent before it was ever codified was sufficient to cause the Nuremberg courts to hang seven doctors. Right. So public health never had a right to lie to us, but it did somehow insert into the culture the right to um, place vaccines outside the realm of criticism, to declare anyone who violates that boundary whether they are scientifically qualified or not, mm -hmm. to declare them heretics and mm. to punish them publicly, mm -hmm. right? To, to cast them out. And that is um, a remarkable story, especially yeah. in light of the fact that a huge fraction of the people who are um, doing the demonizing, doing the work of this vaccine church, mm -hmm. believe themselves to be um, faithless and purely scientific. Right. Right. And this is not how science works. And uh, we can now see, you know, I, I, I am proud to say that you and I played an important role in breaking the public health narrative, which was never true. Mm -hmm. And now a large number of people are awake to this um completely unscientific protection that these technologies enjoy frankly in the market right this is a this is a money changers moment this is a yeah. moment when the money changers you know somebody's coming in to flip card tables uh in the in the temple because mm -hmm. the money changers have taken over what is supposed to be um uh beyond yeah. that corruption yeah um all true, all true. And, you know, I increasingly keep coming back to and thinking about <clears throat> any number of issues, including affirmative action, which is where we're going to spend some time now um, soon. That um, the people who th think of themselves as on the left are more likely to be thinking at sort of the population level, the collective good level, and the people who think of themselves on the right are more likely to be thinking about individual level rights and freedoms. And I think that's true to some extent, and I can see actually shades of that in having read several of the opinions from this Supreme Court decision that got handed down a couple days ago. Uh, but it's also fascinating because, and I've said this before in Dark Horse, a um, long time ago when I was teaching uh, with a uh, an entomologist at Evergreen, uh, we were teaching a we we're going to be teaching a first year program together that is freshman, you know, brand new fall quarter, you know, a lot of kids straight out of straight out of high school. Although we had a lot of a lot of kids, a lot of students at Evergreen that weren't straight out of high school, but um, you know, fresh in college students, and um, we were teaching statistics as part of the program. And one of the things that I asked him, my excellent colleague, you know, what is it that you really really want these students to walk away with after 10 weeks with us. He said, I want them to understand how to think about populations. And that was part of why we did statistics as part of a freshman program that was a lot of field work. And, you know, most, most freshmen do not want statistics as part of that. And, uh, and I, I, that has stuck with me. Um, that, that line has stuck with me that, um, and it then became clear because I then started teaching statistics associated with my animal behavior program and, and, and mostly animal behavior. And it was remarkable. I'm not talking about like, you know, statistical thinking or, you know, understanding whatever software it was that we were using that year, um, or how to make compelling graphics that accurately relate what it is that you have found, uh, with, with the numbers, but just like thinking at the level of, populations versus individuals is actually very, very challenging for people. And yet, the, 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 the people who think of themselves on the left mostly imagine that they are doing things that are good for the population. And they're really not. And I think this may come down to, I, don't, I, I haven't quite figured out where the disconnect is, but it feels like, A, they've often got groups defined that aren't real groups. And B, they don't understand enough about game theory to understand that whatever, you know, solution they put in place isn't simply going to be gamed by the people who will game any system and they'll make off like bandits and leave everyone else, um, you know, deserving and not out of luck. Uh, but there's, there's, there's something very strange about a system in which uh, people are simultaneously basically arguing for um, population level solutions 
who can't actually understand what it means to be in a population or to be um, acting as a member of a population. Well, I don't, I don't know how strange it is. Okay. Um, it goes back to an argument that we've, we've deployed here before. Um, we talked about, uh, awkwardly enough, Team Loser. Um, and the uh, never-ending appetite for communism. And the argument that I would put forward is this. And let's, let's be fair. Civilization does not work very well at the moment. It leaves a large number of people bereft of useful skills. It injures, you know, leaves lead in your water and leaves people dumber than they would otherwise be. All sorts of things. It, it betrays people. But it leaves a lot of people in a position where faced with the rigors of the market, they don't have useful skills to deploy. So they, you know, at best they can sort of be a cog in this machine and uh, it's not a very appealing uh, way to live. The, the, and don't we need to help and protect those people? Of course. Right. We need to fix civilization so it stops hurting people. But and I mean, then, that's like, that's, that's, that's one of the like prime directives of, of team, of team blue largely, right? Like don't it's supposed we? to be, right. but what has <laughs> happened is team blue has become uh, a corrupt entity that parasitizes that instinct yeah. And it attracts now a coalition of people who aren't really, these aren't people who have been burned and are honestly looking for a, you know, a decent way to live. These are people who, uh, upon recognizing that they don't have um, skills to deploy in the market, uh, are interested in tearing stuff down, stealing from other people, right? It's become a coalition and the overarching point is that this is perpetually a source of new inventions of communism. The reason that communism, every time it's tried, it doesn't work, that ex excuses then deployed, it's never really been tried, and it will be tried again and it won't work. Why are we seeing Marxist views suddenly showing up in Team Blue um, when we know very well that they don't work? The answer is, if you divide the world into people who have an above average capacity to make their way in the world as it's found and people who have a below average capacity to make their way in the world as it's found, you have a ready-made coalition amongst people who will be on the losing end to uh, use the system to extract resources from others. So it's like, it's- But there's no suddenly, there's no, there's no su suddenly there's uh... Uh, there's group level solutions from from the left. That's 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 always been part of the. But there, my point is, there are honorable g group level uh, instincts that mm -hmm. did live over on the left. What we are seeing now is not honorable. Yes. It yeah. is cynical from the point of view of the elites, and it is petty and destructive, and not interested in our collective well being elsewhere. It's interested in using that excuse for theft. Yeah. And, um, you know an honorable progressive movement would be a very valuable thing, but it, it essentially doesn't exist. And um, this other thing is sucking up all the oxygen in the room that would result in it uh, emerging. Can we, can we move forward? Yep. Let's do it. All right. Uh, so I could spend weeks clearly uh, delving into uh, weeks, months, years of career, uh, delving into the question of affirmative action and the legal precedents in the U.S. and presumably elsewhere as well. Um, but I did spend a bit of time uh, in the last couple of days following uh, the Supreme Court decision that was handed down on June 29th, two days ago, as we're speaking, uh, in two simultaneous cases. Uh, this was Students for Fair Admissions Incorporated versus President and Fellows of Harvard College and Students for Fair Admissions versus University of North Carolina et al. So the majority opinion was written by Justice Roberts uh, and begins, in these cases, we consider whether the admission systems used by Harvard College and the University of North Carolina, two of the oldest institutions of higher learning in the United States, are lawful under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Uh, there will be no spoilers here when I say that the majority opinion, which was 6-3, uh, was that no, they are not. And um, I will say that Justice uh, Jackson recused herself from the Harvard part of the case because she herself had been uh, in 
um, on the board. I can't remember exactly the title, but she she had been involved enough in Harvard's um, governance uh, that she did not feel that she could um, dispassionately uh, be part of that case. But um, there were, interestingly, uh, six opinions written um, in this case. There was the majority opinion by Roberts, uh, which was joined by the other five uh, the other five justices uh, who were who voted with him that was Roberts, Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. Um, and then this is just in the order of the two hundred and something page um, document with everything. It's got a summary at the top. Then you've got the Roberts majority opinion. Then you've got Thomas concurring in an opinion, Gorsuch concurring, joined by Thomas, Kavanaugh concurring, and then Sotomayor dissenting as joined by Kagan and Jackson, and then Jackson dissenting, even though she had recused herself from the Harvard Harvard part. And so, you know, a, a lot of voices, and I will just, so that it's clear what I feel like I know and what I don't know, I read the summary, the, the so-called syllabus, and I, I read slash skimmed both the Roberts majority opinion, the concurring opinion by Thomas, and the dissenting opinion by Sotomayor. I did not look at Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, or Jackson. Um, so it's fascinating. And I will, maybe I will lead because I've said this before, um, although I'm not sure. No, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna save for the end, sort of where I think, where, where I've been and where I am now on affirmative action. Um, not having had my position changed, although having had it been much more informed by by doing this bit of reading. Let's just go a little bit of history back, both on um, the on a couple of a couple of prime issues here. Um, this um, this history is borrowed from the Roberts, the majority opinion um, by Roberts, again, which came down two days ago on June 29th. The 14th Amendment, right? In the wake of the Civil War, the 14th Amendment, uh, Congress proposes and ratifies it, which specifies that, quote, no state shall deny any person the equal protection of the laws. Um, let me just have a little asterisk here and Sotomayor's dissent in her dissenting opinion, she points out that simultaneous with the passing of the 14th Amendment, Congress enacted a number of race conscious laws to fulfill the amendment's promise of equality, leaving no doubt that the Equal Protection Clause permits consideration of race to achieve its goal. So not the level of um, Bill of Rights, um, of, you know, of, of amendments, but, but that there were simultaneous things that happened at the same level at the same time as the 14th Amendment. Um, and, you know, she, of course, she and those who concur with her um, are using that to support the idea of um, race-based, um, of using race as one of the factors in applications at, in this case, Harvard and UNC. Uh, later, um, a few decades later, Plessy versus Ferguson uh, in 1896 uh, comes out with separate but equal. This is widely understood, I think universally understood now, to be to have been a shameful decision. Yes, um, one of the worst in the courts. One of history. the worst in the courts, as at least the two, um, the, at least Roberts and Thomas say this in their, you know, these, <laughs> it's, it's not that anyone is supporting Plessy v. Ferguson, right? Uh, but that stood, the separate but equal stuff from Plessy v. Ferguson stood for over 50 years. And then we have in 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education. Uh, which uh, which said the right to a public education must be made equal to all on equal terms. And um, then, so that was 1954, Brown. Brown v. Board of Education was 1954. Sort of a, a slightly more niche part of this, because that was all about um, segregation more, more generally. Um, in 1957, uh, Writing on writing an opinion on a case. Um, oh, my notes are weird here. Justice Frankfurter um, summarized. I mean, okay. Justice Frankfurter um, summarized what he saw as the four essential freedoms that constitute academic freedom. This is interesting to me. Quote, it is the business of a university to provide that atmosphere which is most conducive to speculation, experiment, and creation. It is an atmosphere in which there prevail, quote, the four essential freedoms of a university to determine for itself on academic grounds who may teach, what may be taught, how it shall be taught, and who may be admitted to study. Huh. That's a good list. That's a very good list. And it gave me pause. It made me, made me stop. And I, I, I want to continue to spend more time on those four freedoms that 
Justice Frankfurter uh, declared as the four essential freedoms of a university. Again, once more, who may teach, what may be taught, how it shall be taught, and who may be admitted to study. Okay. Some number of years later, in 1978, um, this is coming, I, I'm, I'm getting this history mostly from the, the summary the, of, the, um, of the 2023 decision that just got handed down. In Backey, I think is how it's pronounced, I'm maybe butchering that, Regents of the University of California versus Alan Backey, decided in 1978, um, which was, Backey was a, a former Marine and uh, I think an engineer. Um, who had applied to the UC Davis Medical School two years running. He was a white guy. And he had not gotten in, and some uh, applicants who were not white who came in with lower scores and um, lower GPAs, I believe, had gotten in. And so this got all the way to the Supreme Court, and it turned out that UC Davis Medical School had a, a an explicit quota. 16 out of every 100 applicants, um, no, 16 out, of every seat, 16 out of every 100 seats were set aside for what was then called minority students. And that was found in University of California Regents versus Becky uh, to violate the rights, violate the rights of white applicants. Policy was struck down, and Becky was ordered admitted to UC Medical School. That was a deeply fraught uh, decision. That was 1978. There were six different opinions written by nine justices. Um, there are a lot of opinions written in this case um, this week as well, um, but not not quite. Um, quite as funny. Um, but Justice Powell's opinion back in that 1978 case, writing for himself alone, became a touchstone for race-conscious admissions policies. Powell did not find compelling three of the four claims of benefit from racially motivated admissions policies, but he did find one compelling. He found one of the four um, reasons that the UC uh, regents had, had put forward as compelling, which is that educational benefits flow from a racially diverse student body. Once again, educational benefits flow from a racially diverse student body. And furthermore, he wrote that such an interest is, quote, a constitutionally permissible goal for an institution of higher education. And furthermore, as um, as uh, Justice Frankfurter had already said, uh, such institutions can make their own judgments and selection of their student body. So that is a classic case where um, a decision is made for population level. It's not, Yes. Um, it is that the population of students will be better mm -hmm. if they are racially diverse. That is to say that they bring in experience from different backgrounds. Yes, and actually, as uh, Justice Thomas writes in his uh, concurring opinion, um, which I'll just say, like, I was, I was blown away by his. Um, of the three that I read in some, in some depth, and I did not read, I did not read um, any of them completely, but um, his arguments and also his, uh, just the, the way that he wrote were by far the sort of the most finely tuned and, um, and clear with regard to, um, to, making, to making his points. And he says, I, Justice Thomas, have been, tr have been looking for the evidence that this is true for all of my career and I don't find it. I feel at this like emotional level, like there is educational benefit to having a racially diverse uh, student body. Uh, so I don't, I'm not, I don't think I agree with him at like the emotional level, but he's saying I have been looking for what the, what the purported educational benefits are. And I, and I don't find them. Now I think what's doing a lot of heavy lifting there is the word educational and, you know, education can mean a lot of different things, but, um, let me, can I proceed a little bit mm -hmm. and interrupt at any point. Um, and so that, that Powell's decision in Backey uh, versus the Regents of the University of California um, is is tricky. It's tough. It's you know, and lower courts have been trying to figure out if that's if that if that establishes a binding precedent. Uh, that was again 1978, and then in 2003, we have again apologies for pronunciation, so I'm getting this wrong. Gritter versus Bollinger. Uh, who largely agreed with Powell's opinion that student body diversity is a compelling state interest, but identified a few risks of it, including that um, race 
um, might not be used only as a plus, but also as a negative that is used to discriminate against certain races, which of course um, was certainly uh, the sort of popular understanding of what was happening at Harvard with regard to East Asian students um, uh, experiencing lower acceptance rates um, once it you know, once Harvard's uh, Harvard was using race as one of the components of um, of attributes for applicants in deciding who to accept, and um, and in part to offset these risks, Grutter, um and there's there's disagreement about what what they actually did, what that this decision in two thousand three actually did, um, but it said. At some point, they have to end. Mm. It has to end. There has to be a point, a, a standard that you can point to by which you can say, at the point we get there, then it will end. And they estimated in 2003 that 25 years from now, that would be 2028, um, we should really be there by then. They didn't guarantee, they didn't promise, they presumably hoped it would be earlier, all of that. Um, there wasn't a, you know, a hard stop, but what they said was any policy, A, can't be used as a negative, and B, has to, has to be finite in its, in its temporal scope, basically. Um, okay, so the first paragraph of this... I don't know why they call it a syllabus, but like the, the summary of, of, of the document is Harvard College and the University of North Carolina are two of the oldest institutions of higher learning in the United States. Every year, tens of thousands of students apply to each school. Many fewer are admitted. Both Harvard and UNC employ a highly selective admissions process to make their decisions. Admission to each school can depend on a student's grades, recommendation letters, or extracurricular invo involvement. It can also depend on their race. The question presented is whether the admission systems used by Harvard College and UNC are lawful under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, furthermore, let me find this in this document, and then once I do, Zach, you can um, show my... This is Robert's uh, majority opinion. You can show my screen here. He writes... <clears throat> Any exception to the Constitution's demand for equal protection, again, as found in the 14th Amendment, uh, yeah, must survive a daunting two-step examination known in our cases as strict scrutiny. Under that standard, we ask, first, whether the racial classification is used to further compelling governmental interests. Second, if so, we ask whether the government's use of race is, quote, narrowly tailored, meaning necessary to achieve that interest. Outside the circumstances of these cases, our precedents have identified only two compelling interests that permit resort to race-based government action. One is remediating specific identified instances of past discrimination that violated the Constitution or a statute. The second is avoiding imminent and serious risks to human safety in prisons, such as a race riot. So those are the exceptions um, that Roberts, um, with the majority behind him, specify uh, as uh, as the the compelling interest found in prior cases. Yes, and that's the second one is fascinating. I hadn't thought of it, but I think what they're yeah. saying is if you have to separate people by race to keep uh, a race riot from uh, breaking out, you can do it. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. Um, so the court has struck down, um, has 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 basically uh, has has said no. Harvard and, and UNC cannot continue to to use race as a factor in admissions, and that ruling was based on several factors, including um, that Harvard and UNC's admissions policies fail the two criteria of that two thousand three Grutter decision that I just mentioned. That is, Grutter specified that race may never be used as a negative. But the First Circuit found that Harvard's consideration of race and applications resulted in fewer Asian students being admitted. Mm -hmm. And I will say, just as a side note, like, it inherently has to, right? Like, if, if you are saying, even in, even in the most bland version of affirmative action that possibly exists, you, are, you actually have two identical students and no, that's never going to be the case. And there's only one thing that differentiates them, and that is race. And you, you, and you therefore just use that as one little extra plus and help out the student who is from an historically underrepresented uh, population. You have, of course, de facto um, made, put, made a negative 
for the student who's from an historically not underrepresented population. And this, again, is a point that Thomas also makes. I had already written my little rant here, and um, and Thomas also makes this point. This is, you know, it, 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 it inherently, it inherently does. So therefore, how could you have a policy in place uh, where you say, well, it can be used for a positive, but it can't be used for a negative? Like, well, maybe you're talking about intent, and so you can't intentionally say, we really don't want any of those people. Well, but... But in terms of math, by make by making a choice for one group, you inherently are making a choice against another group. I will steal man their argument. Go for I, it. I don't I don't believe it. Great. But oh. the basic point is, you can't say Asians are overrepresented. It it counts against you that you're Asian. You mm -hmm. can identify a population that's underrepresented, and then it disadvantages the sum total of all of the other things which are not a population. As opposed to what was, and I did not look into it, but what I understand um, to have been the case, um, at least I think at Harvard, where in the sort of the unquantifiable category of like personality, um, Asian applicants were getting downgraded. Yeah. Right. Um, so that that is that is that is a little different, right? It does it does There's feel at least a little an bit argument. different? Yeah. Um, and then. Um, these admissions, and then the second point is these admissions, uh, these admissions policies also lack a logical endpoint. Um, outright racial balancing has apparently or already been established to be patently unconstitutional, uh, and uh, without an endpoint, you know, we we have we have failed to meet what Grutter established in two thousand three as one of the one of the conditions under which effectively affirmative action uh, would would be acceptable. Um, yeah, I have a lot, a lot more, but let's just, let's talk a little bit as I, as I sort of reframe. Sure. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the time point is the, the most. The end point, the like, this can't just go on indefinitely point. But I don't even think that's, yes, the court says that, but yeah. I don't, the point is it was never intended to be a permanent remedy. Right. The whole idea was to right. correct a past wrong. And the glaring fact of the present is if we still need it, does that not demonstrate that it doesn't work? Right. We have had this policy and it has not effectively erased the problem. Therefore, not a good policy. And yes. the so the problem here is yes. the court is ruling that it's unconstitutional implying it was always unconstitutional. I guess maybe Robert's first uh, overriding governmental interest to correct a past wrong is the yeah. issue, the one exemption here. But the point is, if it happens- and, and to correct a past wrong, but also uh, you know, the, the idea that there is educational benefit in a racially diverse student body. Right. That that, 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 is, that is present, there, there is precedent for that position at the level of the Supreme Court. Yep. But from my perspective, and I realize you're, you're holding back where you land on all of this, um, so I don't want to steal your thunder, but the, the concern, those of us who believe there is a serious historical wrong that is not a simple matter to undo, right? Yeah. I think all reasonable people would have to agree with that that it is desirable to undo that, right? Those of us who believe very strongly in merit, for example, believe that it is unfair to hobble somebody at the starting line, you know, or to put weights on them and then yeah. run a race, right? The, the magic of a merit-based system is most fully realized if people are well equipped to compete in the merit-based system to the extent that they have been artificially hobbled by past discrimination, there right. is something to correct. But yes. the glaring problem in the present is it didn't work. It had massive unintended consequences. This mm -hmm. is a classic of uh, progressivism resulting in the creation of a noble program that becomes uh a becomes grotesque in the instantiation yeah and and so therefore the real question is well if this didn't work the last thing we want to do is have it become a loophole 
in the 14th Amendment yeah. that then becomes an addiction. If the point is... An addiction. Yeah, it's good. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what we are looking for is a policy that actually stands a chance of working and that does not uh, cause so much carnage, both in terms of disadvantaging people who did nothing wrong and had nothing to do with past racism mm -hmm. uh, and the destruction of a merit-based system, which is frankly the goose that lays the golden eggs. Right. right. Yes, we should fix it so everybody has access to the merit-based system and the tools in which to compete. But if you want to destroy that system in order that it doesn't embarrass people who've been historically hobbled, then the point is we don't have anything. This is the system that generates the productivity that, yes, is not fairly distributed. But mm -hmm. you do not want to destroy that system in an effort to c correct one of its harms, which is that it's not fairly distributed. Right and fairly distributed, yeah. I do not mean evenly distributed. Evenly distributed would be wildly unfair, right? You want people right. to be rewarded in proportion to their contribution to the functioning of that system, right? That's what you want. That's not an even distribution, but it is a fair distribution, and we're looking for that, and we don't have it, but this policy never did it. And so the question is, was the court correct in overturning a policy were they overturning it because it hasn't worked? Mm -hmm. um, and if so, you know, is that justified on the basis of the time limit that was uh, set by the prior decision? Again, I don't, I don't read it as a time limit. Yeah. Um, they do say in 25 years, we think that this should probably be over, but I don't, and there's a little back and forth um, in between the uh, majority opinion and the, and the dissent. Um, but I don't, I do not read it as a time limit. Uh, but but it but what is clear, um, and what the dissent kind of doesn't want to talk about is uh, that there needs to be an end point. That there yeah. needs to be a way to end it. There needs to be something that outsiders, that anyone can look at and say, what will success look like? How will we know when we've arrived, and therefore can stop this policy? Yeah. Right. And that is what n no one seems seems to have. So let's just um, I'm going to focus for a little bit on the dissent. Um, Sotomayor says, for instance, passively eliminating race classifications did not suffice when de facto segregation persisted. Right? Right. Yep. Uh, I agree with this. However, de facto segregation doesn't exist in higher ed now. Right? Uh, and maybe some will, will uh, disagree. Um, we got chased out of a university where we were tenured, college, we were tenured because you were, you, because I was on sabbatical, because you were arguing against segregation. Yep. And I, that's literally I, what happened. It's funny. Right? It's another one of these things where it had not occurred to me that. Uh, that's exactly what you were doing. Yep. Right. And, uh, and, you know, and what we were talking about behind the scenes together. Um, de facto segregation does not exist in higher ed now, except where the left is creating it again. Put that aside, you know, or in the other domains that the so-called left now control, like in journalism. Like it's 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 not it's not there. It's it's it, you know there's been there's there's been a push to correct, and we would argue with tools that are the wrong tools to be using, but that has um, that has created um, different problems often in the opposite direction from what the original problems were. So also to the extent that there are still inequalities by race due to historical racism in this country, and there are, right? Admissions to institutions of higher ed is not the place to solve the problem. Mm. You know, you, 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 don't, you don't let people in to elite institutions who actually cannot do the work based on the standards that you have otherwise uh, otherwise created. Because by doing so, you will create in them a legitimate inferiority complex because they really are actually inferior. And you will create in the non-minority students a sense that, oh, people like that, whatever that might mean, can't, can't really do the work. And most egregious of all, you will create in the people from historically underrepresented groups who absolutely deserve to be there on their merits a sense that they are constantly battling 
the reality that other people look at them and think, you just got here because of your color. Right. And, you know, and, and we've had we've had students talk to us about this, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the tragedy it's the for tragedy. people yeah. who uh, are perfectly prepared to succeed and are forever dogged by the impression that they got through based on an exemption. And it's really, you yeah. know, it is not only is it tragic at the level of individuals who would survive perfectly well in a merit-based system, yeah. but uh, it also, they are the antidote right? Yes. They are leading the way. This yes. is how it is done. Yes. And to the extent that we hobble people who are succeeding in a merit-based system by creating the impression that something else happened, um, it is counterproductive to the exact thing that the policy is nominally built to, to solve. Exactly. So, you know, throw into this mix um, that race is a squidgy word, that, you know, race is, is, is built on something um, historical, evolutionary, but who calls who, what member of what race now is, you know, largely up for individuals to decide. And uh, I believe, and I don't know if the work has been done, and I would love to see if it, if it has, um, that, and we've talked about zip codes before, but the, the zip code where you grew up is more predictive of your life outcome than is your race at this point. And there's still a lot, you know, there's still a lot of overlap between um, between uh, zip codes uh, that tend that people don't tend to escape from and end up living uh, fulfilling and rewarding lives and race in this country. There is still a lot of overlap, but socioeconomic status predicts, I believe, success more accurately than does race at this point in this country. Right, but the problem the problem with that, and I agree that the zip codes are the way to see it. Right. Yeah. If you and, and that's that that is something that you can actually like that's confined, right? I mean well, the, the borders are it's like, defined. Cares, but yeah. It is it is delineated. But yeah. but the point is, let's say that you could wave a magic wand and eliminate a hundred percent of racism from the system, but change nothing else. The point is zip codes are still unfairly distributed by race. That's the point. Yep. Is that it requires no racism whatsoever for a self perpetuating pattern to continue, including and especially because we collect the revenue for schooling by locality. Right. And so, you know. That's self-perpetuating. It, it is not surprising that Beverly Hills has good public schools and Watts has bad ones, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that system, you take away all the racism and people feel like, oh, well, we took away racism. But mm -hmm. the point is you didn't take away the echo that continues to haunt new generations and that is something that demands a remedy. But at the end of the day, this remedy doesn't work and it creates all sorts of unintended consequences that are intolerable. And, you know, unfortunately, we're having a foolish debate in public about this, right? You've got teams again, right? And yeah. it's people who uh, recognize that this is being used as an excuse, that it is destroying merit, that it is hobbling people who've done nothing wrong and had no participation in the racism that is being remedied, mm -hmm. right? And those people are just done. They have no tolerance for this policy. Then you have other people who, you know, uh, on their best days are looking at the um, inequality that remains in the system, as you can see in that example about zip codes, and the point is, any remedy is a good remedy. And that's never true. Right. Right? No. And again, this, this again, is something that we keep on coming back to. And we've talked about with regard to COVID, with regard to so many things. Like, let's recognize problem A. And someone swoops in and says, we have solution B. And you say, ah, man, problem A is real and big. Um, but your solution isn't the right one. Aha, we are told. Then you don't believe that problem A is really a problem. Right. No, we know that COVID is bad, but we don't think that your treatments that you're calling vaccines are the right approach to dealing with it. No, we know that this country had a ton of racism in it and still has repercussions from it and still has active racism today to some degree. But these solutions don't appear to be working and 
therefore don't seem like the right ones. And this, you know, this, this is the point that you, that you made earlier, like, like, look, we, we tried it. Yep. We've tried it. And this, so I, I will, I will say now, um, I guess I didn't ever really think that much about it. Um, but I was absolutely in favor of affirmative action, hundred mm. percent. And, uh, people have asked both of us in the last few years, like, what have you changed your minds about, uh, really, you know, since Evergreen, since, you know, coats, all of these things. And, uh, this is one of the first things that occurred to me when I started thinking, mm -hmm. think, uh, like, yep, I was wrong about affirmative action. Uh, and the decision by the Supreme Court on June 29th of 2023 with regard to uh, race, using race as an element in admissions at Harvard and UNC, in which they said, you can't do that, that was the right decision. I feel, I, I feel certain that that was the right decision. And I guess one more thing, uh, the dissent, Sotomayor's dissent, um, is frankly, unfortunately, also whiny and self-indulgent. And I don't see that. And again, I didn't read all of the, all of the opinions for the majority that concurred, nor did I read the other dissenting opinion by, by Jackson, but, um, the, both Jackson and Kagan joined this one, so presumably, you know, sort of, you know, signed off on it. Uh, and this isn't particularly egregious, but, well, now I'll read it. This is, again, from Sotomayor's dissenting opinion. At bottom, the six unelected members of today's majority upend the status quo based on their policy preferences about what race in America should be like, but is not, and their preferences for a veneer of colorblindness in a society where race has always mattered and continues to matter, in fact, and in law. What is the word unelected doing there? Yeah. Everything about this is predicated on previous decisions by the court. Also, Sotomayor presumably understands that she herself is unelected as well, as are the other two who dissented. So we've got a Supreme Court, no members of which are elected. We all understand that. They are deciding issues of law and interpretations of the constitution this just seems mean-spirited and small well it's an allegation of legislating from the bench i, I interesting I, I, that I, it is coming from the bench i get that right but it's it's so hypocritical in this case yeah it is and writing that in like that is now that's that's in the annals of of you know american history now like that that aspersion cast Yep. No, it's 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 remarkable and it's it's uh, absurd and tone deaf. But it, I did a little looking into the history of affirmative action, not at the legal level. I was interested to discover that actually the term comes from John F. Kennedy. Oh yeah. And that it was explicitly about reaching oh. a colorblind state for society. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is actually in some ways the important litmus test. We'll, what we have on the left, the people who are uh, decrying this this ruling, yeah. is a hyper race conscious view of the country. Right. Right. That that is a positive thing. That it is a required thing. This is not the vision. This is a hijacking of affirmative action, a failed policy for a new policy, which is hyper race aware. Yep. And that, in and of itself, is an invalidation. Right. That is not what the policy was designed for. The policy was designed to temporarily be used to redress a past wrong, so that it would be no longer necessary. And to the extent that the policy did not uh, make itself obsolete. That's really all you need to know as, as for whether or not um, it's a good policy. I did want to say one other thing about the connection of this that you raise to uh, our spectacular exit from Evergreen. Mm -hmm. It is true that you were on sabbatical. My students stood by me through that episode in which it was alleged that I was a racist. Right. Uh, alleged by students who literally never met me. Um, there's a reason for that. 
And it is because I, and when you and I were both teaching, you and I were teaching things that were highly relevant to questions like this. We specifically, we did not avoid questions of race. We talked about mm -hmm. the fact that um, race is a racist instantiation of a correct biological phenomenon. Lineage mm -hmm. is real. Race is a bastardization used to disadvantage people, right? Or traditionally it has been. We talked about why evolutionarily that would be the case. And we talked significantly about what biology has to say about the remedy here. And what I think folks on the right frequently get wrong mm -hmm. is that they do not understand how much of this is uh, remediable if one actually looks at the deep causation. In other words, the populations that have persistently not done well in our system are populations that were systematically disadvantaged, that were effectively had their culture scrambled in order to make them compliant, right? And so understanding that, it's not a fun topic to think about, yeah. but understanding that history and why it has taken some groups and made it difficult for them to overcome past hobbling is crucial. I don't see how we solve this without an understanding of that. And, you know, doing what many on the right do, which is pretending that or mistakenly concluding that it is some sort of uh, unfortunate but inherent characteristic, right? That doesn't help. Mm -hmm. And um, pretending that the only thing going on is that there are bad people stealing from good people and that transfer of wealth is the way to do this, that doesn't work. What yep. we need to do is actually look the problem squarely in the eye and say, you know, populations that have faced uh, a persistent obstacle. What is special about the history there? Because when you look, you find it, right? It was a disruption. Uh, and, you know, really the only model that I think will suffice here is one in which you understand that culture and genes are equally biological, right? Yeah. Because there was a lot of damage done culturally and intentionally so. So I believe it's Thomas in his uh, concurring opinion who points out that, uh, and this you know this will be, this will be regarded by those who are decrying this decision as sort of standard conservatives talking points. But, but really, uh, Thomas points out uh, that the specific population of students uh, who uh, are have been disincentivized from applying to Harvard because their rates of acceptance are going down um, are East Asian students, I believe. And there's actually a lot of stuff around too, like what even does Asian mean? So, you know, South Asian, East Asian, but I, I, I think it was East Asian. I may have that wrong. Maybe just say Asian. Um, <clears throat> but Thomas, uh, in his, in his concurring opinion says, isn't that a population that in this country at least part of them were literally put into camps in World War II. And they are the ones being discriminated against now, not asking for help, um, but having, having come through that, which was heinous, which was deplorable American policy. Yep. Right. Uh, and some of, the people who are downstream of exactly the people who were incarcerated by the American government on American soil. These were including, you know, American citizens, Japanese American citizens, um, whose descendants are now having a hard time getting into elite institutions because why? Because too many of them tick too many of the boxes that make them look like really good academic bets. That confuses the story of, Past injustice makes it difficult to pull yourself up. It just does. Right. Um, but again, I want to make this clear. We have examples of populations that have faced real disadvantages that have succeeded in our system. And we have advantages of populations that persistently struggle. The distinction, in my opinion, is based entirely in whether or not the culture of those groups survived intact. Right? Systematic disruption of yep. the culture of Native Americans and African Americans is the distinction. It's not endogenous capacity. And 
That is not mm. a fun point to recognize, but it is a point that has a tremendous amount of hope built into it because once you realize that actually there was a systematic campaign to hobble, it took place at the cultural level. And the fact is, yeah, you can have come to the US, you can have been ghettoized into a Chinatown or a little Japan or whatever it was, but you kept your culture and yep. that culture is the bootstraps, right? So there, there's hope there in some ways, but it's also, there's also a kind of hopelessness, I think, because uh, just as you, you've said this often, you, you can't create a myth. You can't write a myth. You can't, you can write a story um, that if it's really compelling, may stand the test of time and become a myth. Uh, in general, you also can't invent a religion, although people seem to be working on that. Um, but you also can't really create a culture overnight. No, but... So having, having you know, emerged from uh, intact cultures that were scrambled intentionally in order to um, create enforced compliance, by how, like, what, what, then, what then is to be done? Well, I mean, I, this, is, this is the answer, is that culture, I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know mm. and haven't written extensively about, but culture is the secret sauce of humans. And the interesting thing about it, right, as a biological phenomenon that is typically handed down vertically, it is transmissible horizontally, and that's why it's special. And the point is, the real answer involves democratizing the culture that we share as Americans, right? Why do I think of George Washington as my forefather? He's not my forefather. Right, but he is my forefather because he's the forefather of my culture, and it is the extent to which the culture has been uh, distributed in an unfair way, and that that persists into the present. Now, it's a very difficult problem to solve. Now, yeah, because... I, I mean, I, I feel like there's two there's two big barriers to this. One of them is um, most modern American culture isn't fantastic. That's not what I'm talking about. And the other big barrier is, of course, that it's not actually the government or the press secretary that raises the children, right? It, it, or the teachers, right? They're not, they're, that's not their job and that's not their right. It's the families. So, the, you know, the cultural stuff exists at the family level. Um, you know, family, families bring in the culture and teach it to their children, uh, but absent families you know, we may all be swimming in some kind of a general, if you're in America, like cultural American soup. Uh, but but the the way that you end up with with the values and the historicity and the, you know, the 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 habits of both mind and body are going to happen kind of at the individual level, largely at home. Largely at home, except you're dealing with a I mean, look, this is how you get to game B, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because once you realize that this is not a problem that can be remedied by minor tweaks to what we've got and then we don't have to worry about it anymore, you realize you're talking about a total restructuring. But at the moment, you're dealing with um, corporations that study the minds of young people to figure out how to trick them into spending money on things that harm their health and damage their minds, yeah. right? You can't have a society in which you get rich by externalizing harm onto other people, right? So this is one of a dozen different places that we could point to, well, yes, the family is where you get your values, but how difficult is it to pass on values when somebody just outside your door or coming in through your kid's iPad or whatever is trying to induce them to see the world upside down so that they will spend money in some way? So we so have a predatory society. This this is true, but you also need um, that family has to be intact. Of course, of course. But again, even that, even that. Why is it that um, black families are more likely to be single parent families? Right. The answer to that question, it turns out, is tied up in a skewed sex ratio. Sex ratio that is the result of a massive level of incarceration of black males. What that does is it hobbles black females in uh, negotiations between the sexes. That is to say, if black females do not have 
black males in large numbers than those who exist uh, outside of the system of incarceration are in extra high demand, it's very hard to get them to settle down. So that is not a feature inherent to a population. That is a result of circumstances. Now, I'm not excusing the disproportionate level of criminality. On the other hand, that well, yeah, is the circumstances downstream. are perpetuating themselves because the young men are growing up in environments in which it clearly makes more sense by most by, by most analyses uh, to sell drugs on the street than to go to terrible, uh, dangerous schools. Yeah, I mean, you know, these are dangerous conversations to have because, yeah. you know, in order to get the nuance right, you have to nail every word. But the right. point is, look, nobody chooses a life of crime who has great alternatives, right? You choose a life of crime because it actually beats the alternatives that you do have. And so the structure of the civilization that creates that predicament that causes people to engage in crime because yeah. it's their better option, that's the thing that needs to be cured. Is, does that, is it as simple as recognizing that? Of course not. But You know, we were just, Zach and I, our producer, um, we're just talking about this yesterday in a different domain, which was sex work. Mm -hmm. Right. Nobody chooses. No, no, no little girl dreams about being on the pole or worse, right? Or selling her body for sex. That is a choice that some people end up making because circumstances have provided a bunch of choices in which that appears to be the best one. And in some of their cases, it is the best one. And that's terrible. Yep. That does not make it an awesome choice. It makes their circumstances terrible and something that we do have a responsibility at the societal level to consider how to address something that does not involve penalizing those who are hardworking and skillful and making a go of it. Absolutely. Now, the fundamental at the bottom of all of this, and you know, we don't really know this, but everything that I have seen tells me that people are, uh, while far from blank slates, are overwhelmingly similar in their capacity at birth. Mm. And that what happens is a wild distortion of developmental environments where some yeah. people have the benefit of really good developmental environments. Some people have bad developmental environments that teach them a very important lesson that results in them doing well. That's also- Skyrocket. Right. right. But anyway, the let's put it this way. The idea that there is something that we can't really talk about, you know, endogenous differences in capacity, blah, 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 blah. That becomes an excuse not to address the problem because it's like, well, it's genes. But the evidence that it's genes is not anywhere near as strong as people think it is mm -hmm. because they don't understand the problems with the term heritability. They don't understand what it right. really means. And they don't understand how it is that something can be genetically heritable and not be a blueprint that's inescapable. Lots of genetically heritable stuff is perfectly remediable at a non-genetic level. And if that sounds like a paradox to you, that's because you don't understand what biologists mean when they say heritable, right? I swear it's a, it's a very broken term because the common parlance implications of it have nothing to do with the actual biological meaning of it. Cool. Um, yeah. So, um, maybe, maybe, Maybe that's it. Maybe maybe we're there. Uh, I am. Um, I don't know that I've ever read uh, much of a an opinion that was just handed down by the Supreme Court before. I don't think I've ever had any reason to. Um, and what I have read, what I did read of this, actually gave me some hope. There, the 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 clarity and nuance in much but not all of what i read uh in these opinions um that is again roberts thomas and sotomayor and the summary at the top um was remarkable and an education and uh that's great that we actually, uh, you know, an informed, you know, no legal background at all person uh, who is smart can go in and read these things and go like, oh, okay, you know, I can find that, that decision that is mentioned, go find that and, and sort of cross reference and go, okay, yeah, I, I agree with the majority opinion. 
Yeah, that, that's interesting. And, yeah. um, you know, the specter of a, uh, a court that was not so divided that it was unlikely to overturn um, past precedent has been uh, used as a, as a boogeyman against those of us on yeah. the left for a very long time to yeah. prevent us from thinking independently about politics. And, uh, you know, at least what you see is a court being very deliberate about these decisions, which is exactly what it is supposed to do. Yep. Um, so anyway, it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting legal era. Yeah, it is indeed. All right. We are going to take a 15 minute break and uh, be back with a Q&A shortly. Uh, we're also going to be back with another live stream this Wednesday and then another one a week from now. So we're going to do three. We're going to do one on Wednesday, July 5th, that's going to be, and then Saturday, July 8th, and then we're gone again for a little bit. And then we'll start our uh, regular Wednesdays at 1130 Pacific uh, schedule starting whatever that day is. I don't know. In the future, <laughs> um, it is sure. in the future, sometime yeah. later in July. Um, and soon, hopefully, we're going to have a website where, we, where you can just check in on that stuff. Um, but for right now, uh, we have, I guess it's just going to be us doing live streams for a couple, uh, a, a couple times now, but then we have, you've got, you've recorded a few episodes, guest episodes that, um, are ready to come out, um, with, you know, really great, um, great guests. You know, I mentioned last time, okay, we got some coming out that are going to be good. And boy, you know, you even mentioned Vivek, uh, Ramaswamy, mm -hmm. uh, that conversation. And then RFK, you got two presidential candidates, uh, in these recently released Dark Horse episodes. So go, go check those out. Uh, if you need more Dark Horse before we come back to you next Wednesday and, um, you know, check out Natural Selections, which is where I write weekly. I wrote, um, a bit more about, um, the childhood vaccination schedule this week. Uh, we have, again, that uh, new merchandise at darkhorsestore.org, PSYOP until proven otherwise, and uh, lots of other great things. I was, we were lucky to be with friends um, on Salt Spring Island in Canada this last weekend, and I was carrying around my Epic Tabby tote bag. Uh, and yes, yes, absolutely. It was, it was wild. And by the way, happy Canada Day. Happy Canada Day. Yeah, indeed. Um and uh, we have, uh, you know, Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century available everywhere. Still signed copies available at Darville's right here uh, in the San Juan Islands. We have uh, Patreons where you can find us and also Locals, uh, which is easy to get to from Rumble. We're going to be moving our stuff from Patreon into Locals, but there's already, it looks like, a, an interesting community happening at Locals. Uh, you had one of your Patreon conversations today. You're going to have another one tomorrow. Excellent, as always, and tomorrow I'm looking forward to that one as well. I'm going to yeah. call it Evolution. Excellent. Um, so um, consider joining joining us there, and um, s you can access our Discord server too through those Patreons, and soon um, on on locals as well. And the Discord Discord community is is very lively. Um, once again, check out our sponsors for this week, which were Biome, uh, maker of knobs, American Hartford Gold, and Seed, uh, with their probiotics, and consider subscribing to Rumble please. Uh, and liking, sharing, subscribing. We've got clips. Um, everything's on that Rumble channel. We've also still um, on YouTube. Until we see you next time, which may be 15 minutes from now, maybe four days from now, maybe sometime distant in the future. He's still going to be a dude. He's still going to be a dude. And I want to encourage you to be good to the ones you love, even and maybe especially if they are dudes. Mm -hmm. Be good to the ones you love, eat good food, and get outside. Be well.